In the late 1920s, the tiny hamlet of Buildswas in Shropshire became the site of a super power station. When the site of the power station was being decided, the engineers from the WMJEA, the West Midlands Joint Electricity Authority, had grave concerns about the Buildswas site due to the historical flooding from the nearby River Severn. Eventually, it was the River Severn that was the final deciding factor. A power station needs water, and lots of it. But also, a power station needs coal, and this station was next to the East Shropshire coal fields. So, Granville and Kemberton collieries were producing lots and lots of coal in the local area, and this would eventually power the plant. The coal was referred to as West Midland Slack, or South Wales Dove, depending on where it came from, but either way it was classed as a low-grade coal. The site itself was served by two railways. One was the Severn Valley Line, which ran from Shrewsbury to Bridge North and beyond. The other railway to run into the site ran off the Shrewsbury to Wolverhampton Line via Maidley Junction. This crossed through Lightmoor and then over an impressive viaduct at Colbrook Dale, then over the epic Albert Edward Bridge over the River Severn into the site. This was later a solo goods line. From 1924 onwards, plans were drawn up, site visits were made and eventually, in May 1929, work started on building Power Station A, Buildswas. Work officially started on Power Station A in May 1929, but by November of the same year, floods had halted construction. This meant serious amendments needed to be made from the design from the Chief Engineers Hetherington. Power Station A was due to have five sets, each generating 25 megawatts, with a view to be reaching 50 megawatts. The final revised plan was for one 50 megawatt generator to be operational over the winter of 1931 to 1932. The building was made in such a way that eventually it could take another 50 megawatt generator in the same space. And that could be generating electricity by the winter of 1940 to 1941 giving the total power station an outage of 100 megawatts. Building a power station of this size involved a lot of hard labour. 300 casual labourers were brought in, not to mention the steel fixers and the carpenters, and steam shovels. It was a case of if you could pick the right tools up, you get the job. One of the major problems with this location is getting materials to site. And finally, in late 1930, the river crossing was completed, a steel frame truss bridge. Before this bridge, everything else was bought by rail. On the 13th of October 1932, Ironbridge Power Station A was open for business. It was opened 101 years to the day that Michael Faraday found the principles of making electricity. It was opened by the Minister of Transport, PJ Pybus. A large party dined in the space where the second 50 megawatt generator would eventually go. Ironbridge A was not going to win any awards for its output with a mere 50 megawatts. Unlike other power stations such as Hams Hall, churning out a massive 249 megawatt. 
Iron Bridge A over the years expanded, expanded and expanded and became one of the largest power stations in the country. The entire power station has been built with efficiency in mind and this is evident in the design of the innovative coal stacking area, handling over 500 to 600 tonnes of coal a day. With future projections in mind, the actual plant could hold up to 2,000 tonnes of coal a day. The marshalling yard was actually big enough to hold 250 coal wagons and the departure loops were built into embankments which acted as flood defence barriers. A lot of people didn't really have the luxury of electricity, but Ironbridge A was designed to provide power of up to 110 square miles. A further 300,000 square miles were required to connect the entire network. Expansion was needed and over the years new boilers were added and second lines of chimneys in 1938 to 1939. The station was run like a military operation under the control of Percy Pinder, 1931-1953. Known as Cunning Isaac, with his luxury panelled office, little escaped Percy's beady eyes and he especially liked to make unannounced tours to the site to keep their workers on their toes, driving into the turbine hall in his personalised car. During and after the war, electricity was in great demand. Power Station A was producing 200 megawatts at full capacity. To keep up with this demand for electricity, during the 1950s, 60s and 70s, a programme of power stations were built across the UK. Ironbridge B was already running on full capacity. It was clear another power station was needed. After the war, confidence really grew. New towns were being planned everywhere, such as Milton Keynes, Telford, Runcorn, to name a few. All of these places would need power stations, and this huge network of new stations were opening up. With the new town of Telford being planned in the early 1960s, it was clear a bigger power station was needed. So, plans were drawn up for Power Station B at Iron Bridge. Before we can build another power station, let's see how one works. This is Drax, a coal-fired power plant in England. The size of two Manhattan Central Parks side by side. This machine puts out almost 4,000 megawatts of power, enough to light up 5 million homes. This new style coal burner has found a way to process and burn an old style fuel. And it does it so efficiently, it's now among the cleanest mega coal plants in the world. Let's see how it works. Drax burns up to 36,000 tons of coal every day. That's 26 train loads. The trains dump the coal into giant hoppers. They slow down, but never stop. Every month, they dump enough coal to fill a 70,000-seat football stadium. But Drax doesn't burn chunks of rock. It's not explosive enough. So, it converts the coal to dust. A network of conveyors sends the raw coal to these pulverizing mills. Each mill has 10 one-ton steel balls packed together on a track. Coal drops into the mill through here, and the ring of balls crush the rock. A single pulverizer makes 36 tons of coal dust in an hour, and Drax has 60 of them. The coal dust is now an explosive fuel, lit up by propane and oil burners. This coal dust and air mixture burns at over 2,000 degrees Celsius. Each boiler is a mega kettle. 
with flames five stories high. Ten stories above the flames, inside a network of steel tubes, water transforms to high-pressure steam, hot enough to melt lead. Drax is now ready to generate some serious electricity. The steam heads to the turbine hull. The turbines are housed in six units, each the size of a locomotive. Inside, five steam turbines. Each spins a drive shaft connected to a generator. When the steam hits the turbines, its explosive pressure spins the blades at 3,000 RPM. The blade tips travel at one and a half times the speed of sound, pumping out a million horsepower. That's the same as 6,500 passenger cars. So, burn coal, boil water, make steam, and spin 300 tons of stainless steel at Mach 1.6 to create 23,000 volts of electricity. Voltage measures how powerfully electrons flow through a wire. And Drax needs much more than 23,000 volts to get power to its millions of customers. The transformers at Drax take the 23,000 volts from the turbines and step it up to 400,000. Which is great for the national grid. But what about this stuff? Burning coal is dirty business. It belches out harmful gases that cause smog and acid rain. Drax captures 90% of these toxic emissions before they hit the atmosphere. Smoke blows into these electrostatic precipitators. Toxic particles cling to these metal plates like fridge magnets as the smoke passes through. But that filtered smoke still contains sulfur, the culprit in acid rain. So, before it's sent to the smokestack, it's cleaned again. Every week, 10,000 tons of limestone is crushed into powder and mixed with water to form a slurry in this giant blender. When smoke is pumped through the slurry, sulfur is chemically locked into it. The resulting combo makes 750,000 tons of gypsum every year. The stuff that makes drywall and plasterboard. 36,000 tons of coal burnt up in a day, recovering most of its toxic emissions. This machine has always been powerful, but recent innovations have turned it into one of the cleanest plants of its size in the world. It was in the early 1960s that Iron Bridge was chosen to be the next power station. It was lucky for the CEGB that they owned the land already, so it was perfect again in every single way. Officially, it was given the green light on the 1st of April 1963. The site was large enough for a further two 500 megawatt generators, maxing the power at 1000 megawatts. Designs were already available from other power stations that were already being built, and at the same time, Rouge Lee was also under construction with the same layout. Planning for the power station was fairly straightforward, receiving little or no opposition from the local people. They knew how many jobs this power station could bring to the local community. The Ironbridge B site during the 1960s was clearly one of the largest building sites in the Midlands. Alfred McAlpine were responsible for building the four towers and also the foundations to the power station itself. 
Construction work had begun on the 19th of June 1963 and was hoping to be generating electricity by July 1967. That gives it a five year build programme. The station was proposed to cost 42 million to build with a lifespan of 30 years. The project architect was Alan Clark and the project was run by Guy Downham. One thing that was causing the locals a lot of concern was the 206 metre stack. This chimney was set in pale concrete so it blended into the low cloud and steam cover from the nearby cooling towers. This was one of Shropshire's tallest structures. That makes this stack taller than the BT Tower and the Blackpool Tower alone. With construction work picking up pace during the 1960s, John Langs built the next new access over the river into Ironbridge B. This was a concrete road bridge. Just ahead of them was Alfred McAlpine and they built another concrete bridge over the existing railway line. Alfred McAlpine and John Lang were joined by Gleeson, another civil engineering contractor. Gleeson was responsible for the massive drainage infrastructure on site. By 1965, thousands of trades were working on site on various different jobs. A third of those jobs were taken up by carpenters creating shuttering for the concrete. The house, which was well under construction, was nearly 60 metres tall, with the turbine hall just below that at 36 metres. These were epic aircraft hangar sized buildings. As we rolled into 1966, 2,000 workers were all on site at Ironbridge B. Another important aspect of this site was the landscaping and making sure that this industrial site blended seamlessly into the surrounding countryside. Kenneth Booth was the man chosen to landscape this industrial site. He arrived on site in his caravanette walking round dressed in tweed. Kenneth was later joined by Sylvia Crow. Planning the landscaping around this site was no easy feat. So the station had to blend into the countryside. Trees were planted outside the site near Cressage and Leighton. 
to ensure that the power station was hid away in the future as much as possible. Other parts of the power station were also given other elevational features to make it blend into the surrounding countryside. As well as the cooling towers and the chimney, the 190 meter switchgear building was built between both power stations to aid its close proximity. Later in 1973, the power station went on to win an award with the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors. The most iconic part of the power station were the four cooling towers. Kenneth Booth made sure that these blended into the surrounding countryside and they were actually placed around the arc of the railway. Most cooling towers are always grouped together but these were all laid in a line on a gentle curve. It was very unique for this type of power station. The positioning of these towers was also vital Kenneth made sure that these cooling towers could not be seen from the centre of the world famous Iron Bridge. Each of the four cooling towers were 115 metres tall. In 1963, the discussion came about of colour. What colour should the Iron Bridge Power Station cooling towers be? Most cooling towers around the UK are of a grey colour, pale concrete or a sandy colour. But would this be the right scheme for Iron Bridge? It was decided that dead grey, as it was called, would be too harsh. And then someone suggested a khaki colour or a camouflage. Booth, undecided, then climbed the reekin and realised that most of the soil around that area was a ready pink colour. It was decided a tint would be added to the concrete. 
and this was an additional cost of £10,000 per tower, that's £40,000 extra for the towers. In November 1965, two of the four towers were already constructed. In the same month, catastrophically, three of the eight cooling towers collapsed in gales at Ferrybridge Power Station. Up till now, the standard width of a cooling tower wall was just five inches. But after the accident at Ferrybridge, it was decided that the remaining two cooling towers at Ironbridge would be strengthened to provide a thickness of 7 inches. The original two cooling towers that were already built were later reskinned with concrete. The standard cooling tower design was set out by a company called Film Cooling Tower Limited. The cooling towers are a real marvel of engineering and a testament to the people that built them.
These pink towers have been on the skyline of the Shropshire countryside for decades and really are the symbolisation of the Ironbridge Gorge. Before Power Station B was open, members of the public and local authorities were invited to come and have a look around this mega station.
Ironbridge Power Station B was online on the 11th of June 1969. Unit 1 came online at 4.01pm generating 500 megawatts of power. That was closely followed by Unit 2 and that was online by the 27th of February 1970 at 2.32am. Unfortunately, there was no lavish opening ceremony. A lot of the old workers were very, very committed to Power Station A and its beautiful brasswork. I think they felt that Power Station B was just a little bit bland and boring. By this time, T.E. Stanley was in charge of Power Station A. He was the superintendent. He then came over to Power Station B. He was a very experienced man, very old school. He joined Ironbridge in 1948. During the 1970s, the station was generating 1,000 megawatts of power, not to mention the extra power that was being delivered from Power Station A. The station was getting a reputation by the workers and it was called the Cinderella Station. During the early years, Power Station B was plagued with problems. At best, it could only generate 420 to 430 megawatts per unit. These problems eventually were ironed out and eventually it became to generate on full power. Let's take a look how the Power Station functioned. In the generator house at Ironbridge Power Station, it had two 500 megawatt turbo generator sets manufactured by AEI. The turbine arrangement consisted of one high pressure turbine, HP, one intermediate pressure turbine, IP, followed by three low pressure turbines, LP. The later control room at Iron Bridge featured a fully computerised system known as the Advanced Plant Management System or APMS. This consisted of three banks of large rear projection screens around two operator workstations and an engineering workstation. APMS completely replaced the original control desks which were arranged over a much larger space. The upgrade was completed in 1997, one of the original control panels still remains in the open space. The boiler house at Ironbridge B is mostly a metal clad structure and much attention was taken during its design process. Various other cladding materials have been used on some surfaces, creating bold cubic masses. The boiler house contained two boilers, manufactured by Forster Wheel. Along with the new boilers were associated coal delivery systems and mills. Directly on the other side of the boiler house, there were two 17.5 megawatt generators. 
Powered by a Rolls-Royce Olympus aircraft engine, it was encased in solid brick to cut down on the searing noise. These were powered by gas and at peak time they were used as emergency generators. Ironbridge Power Station is made up of the following things. An admin block, which includes a boardroom, two switchgear buildings, four cooling towers, a boiler house and coal crushing plant, an ash chimney, also known as a stack, water pumps, a generator or turbine hall, the control room, the coal plant and the railway yard. Ironbridge Power Station has become one of the most photographed subjects in Shropshire and I'm sure the original landscape architect Kenneth Booth would appreciate how great and how fantastic this power station blends into the surrounding Shropshire countryside. I think this is a testament to his landscape design. Building a power station has always been about efficiency and during 1968, during construction, a money saving idea was created between the National Coal Board and the Central Electricity Generating Board. The power station were always looking at new ways of saving money and one that was looked at was the coal delivery system. This was due an upgrade. During the time of power station A, they were handling over 10,000 tonnes of coal a day and the only way to dispatch that coal was with rotating tippers. This involved the use of shunters which was very labour intensive and not very cost effective. The Central Electricity Generating Board, British Rail and British Coal got together and decided to design a new kind of wagon. The final design was a wagon that could be kept coupled together during its visit to the power station. These new wagons would be able to carry 32 tonnes of coal in each one. They will also benefit from an automatic discharge and locking procedure. 
Dog, the new Colt dispatch area was operated with just two men and their job was to release the safety catch. A Class 47 diesel loco was required to travel at just half a mile an hour to allow the coal to be dispatched to the conveyors below. The idea was trialled at West Burton. Ironbridge finally had its system in place in January 1968. The efficiency of this system was quickly noted and it was the template for most power stations in the UK. During the late 1970s, Power Station B was running on full capacity, producing 1000 megawatts. For much of the 1970s, Power Station A and B sat alongside each other, generating electricity. Then, in October 1976, the entire A plant was closed down for the entire summer. The power station was then kept online during the winter months until the final closure date which was the 19th of January 1978. By 1980 the entire building was abandoned. Questions were asked of what to do with such an elegant building. It was suggested that it should become a museum of electricity but that was turned down due to the high maintenance costs. It was then offered to the Ironbridge Gorge Museum for just £1 for a museum. To no avail, in 1982, demolition began. demolition begun, the signal telegraph equipment from the turbine hall was put pride of place in Station B's reception area. Two steam shunting engines, one was moved to the Horsey Steam Trust, the other to Foxfield Railway in Stoke. Shortly after the demolition of Power Station A, thoughts came to actually building another power station, Power Station C. However, the idea did not pick up speed. One thing that did survive the demolition of Power Station A was a rather lavish pump house which is perched on the banks of the River Severn. One of the most important parts of having a power station is that water supply and the River Severn has been supplying water to the power station for decades. Ironbridge has always been sanctioned by the National Rivers Authority for how much water they take out of the River Severn, but also what they put back. Although a lot of water is cleaned and recycled and then put back in the river, however some is lost due to evaporation so let's have a look at how a power station uses river water. There's another use of water in this huge building, right by the river. This 
is the power station at Ironbridge. It burns coal and makes electricity. But as well as coal, it needs a vast quantity of water. It gets that from the River Severn, and in it goes to the power station through this metal grill. And there's the water actually being sucked out of the river and into the works, over 100 million litres every day. In fact, as much river water flows through this building as goes straight on down the river. Jenny Collett showed me round, but we could hardly hear each other because of the noise from all the machinery. This is the giant turbine hall. The first thing they use river water for is heat it up to make steam. The steam then drives the turbines that make the electricity. There's a massive pipe work in here, carrying steam and water round the building. Another use for water is to keep all the equipment in here cool. But once the water's done its job, it becomes hot and has to be cooled down itself. And that's what happens in these massive cooling towers. The warm water that's cooled all the equipment falls down through the air like rain. This cools it down. Jenny took me to have a look inside one of the cooling towers. in here turns into a fine mist that rises up inside the tower. It comes out of the top like homemade clouds and 30 million litres of River Severn water blow away on the breeze. But most of the cooled water that falls through these cooling towers is pumped round and used again or put back into the river. Another 10 years later, in the 1990s, the Central Electricity Generating Board was split up into two different companies. Privatisation was the key word during the 90s. And the power station had various owners including Paragen and then Eon. The plant consumed 20,000 tonnes of coal a year. As we then came into the millennium, in 2006, the Friends of the Earth said that Ironbridge B was the worst polluting power station in the UK. Also in 2006, Ironbridge B had opted out of the Large Combustion Plant Directive which was set out by the European Union. In a nutshell, power stations were told to spend money on upgrading their stations or have them close. With Ironbridge B choosing to opt out, that meant that they only had 20,000 hours left of operation before the power station had to close. That meant in 2015 Ironbridge B would close forever. There just simply wasn't the money to plough into these power stations to upgrade them and the 205 plants across Europe most of them had to close and most of them were in the UK. Ironbridge still had to look at cheap ways of producing electricity and that is where they found biomass.
You may remember us bringing you the story here on Midlands today of controversial plans to burn millions of tonnes of imported wood at an Ironbridge power station in Shropshire. Well, the plans have now been backed by the government. But the BBC has uncovered confusion over who will check where the wood comes from and a government report which says there's a fundamental problem with the plans. Our environment correspondent David Gregory has been investigating. The switch from burning coal to burning wood to generate electricity has proved unpopular with some. The plans involve burning two million tonnes of wood imported from North America every year. That's equivalent to a fifth of all the timber produced in the UK or an area of densely packed forests stretching from Wellington to Wenlock. But the company behind the plans, E.ON, says they are sustainable. We only purchase the wood from accredited sustainable sources. That has to be audited and monitored through Ofgem. Uh, it has to meet their requirements. If we don't meet their requirements, it isn't class as sustainable. We do not then receive the renewable obligation certificates. But Ofgem have told us the only checking they'll do on the scheme is to ask E.ON themselves if the wood supply is sustainable. Moves to tighten up this approach are currently being consulted on by the government. With only 20,000 hours to run before Ironbridge Power Station closes down, the choice was made to run on biomass at a huge estimated cost of 130 to 140 million just for the upgrading of the facilities. The biomass was bought by ship from North America to Liverpool docks, then transported by train to the Ironbridge power station. The investment in biomass was very strange. The power station would only be generating 370 megawatts per unit. That's a far cry from the days when they were doing 500 megawatts per unit. Ironbridge Power Station was to become the largest biomass power station in the world. But it was a long way ahead of any other power station that burnt biomass. In actual fact, the nearest competitor was Kraft in Finland, where they were producing 265 megawatts. The power station has always prided itself on having a robust fire safety plan. But in the power station's history, there's only been two notable fires. The first one was on the 10th of October 1998 when one of the turbines caught fire and destroyed it. But this was actually rebuilt and put back in action. A serious fire occurred on the 4th of February 2014 an iron bridge was ablaze. Unit 1 was completely destroyed and the fire started around about 6am. With iron bridge opting out of the EU directive, that meant that the power station was closing in 2015. So it wasn't profitable or viable to actually replace the turbine. So it was just left. This bombshell really, really hit iron bridge hard and it left the power station generating just 370 megawatts of power until the eventual demise.
This incredible photo shows when the generator actually exploded. On November 20th, 2015, at 2.30pm in the afternoon, Mike Smith, former employee, turned the power off to Ironbridge Power Station. Mike, who is retired from his role as shift charge engineer, had been invited back to press the button to cease generation to mark the closure of the plant. A small team will now begin decommissioning the plant, which is due to run into early 2017, ensuring the plant is shut down properly and the site is secure, and the team will also remove the fixtures and fittings, including a large mosaic that was designed and created by the children of St Martin's Modern School in Oswestry. Street. The mosaic will be returned back to the school. It really is a sad day for everybody. Over 400 people worked at the power station during its height of generation. A lot of people ponder and think about what's going to become of the site in the near future. Almost immediately after closure in 2015, the decommissioning process begun. The decommissioning has to be done before proper demolition can begin. The station has to be cleared of all contamination. That could be asbestos, oil, fuel or any other potential harmful chemical. Once this is done, the site can then be ready for demolition. The decommissioning of the power station was completed in 2017 by then owners Unipa. This huge brownfield site then went on the market for a prospective buyer to snap up. In 2018 the Harworth Group bought the 350 acre brownfield site. Almost as soon as Harworth bought the site big parts of the site started to disappear such as the big conveyors the endless pipes and steel work, there was so much work to be done in the demolition of this site. On Friday, October the 16th, 2018, the general public were invited on the power station site to look at Harworth's proposals for this development. At the consultation event, members of the public were told that Harworth planned to build 1,000 houses, but these will be of a contemporary style with five distinct housing areas. The site will also feature commercial units, a school and a local centre and a new park and ride and a railway station which will link up with the Telford Steam Railway. As well as new road infrastructures, the site will benefit from three separate vehicular accesses. Two on the Much Wenlock Road and one over the existing concrete bridge over the River Severn. The landscaping is key within this project, as it was back in the 1960s when this power station site was originally being proposed. Bentall Woods and Billswas and the ponds and pools and woods and various footpaths will all be retained and new areas created. It will be like creating the ideal garden village. Steve here from Telford Ultimate Guide and we are at um, the Telford Power Station, uh, Biltos Power Station, Ibridge Power Station um, in Telford in Shropshire and um, we're here today because um, the Harworth Group have got a exhibition on talking about the future of the power station um, and some of their um, plans for it and obviously I've just been on a bit of a tour of the of the site and to see those beautiful curling towers which are in the background there as you can see um, and you know one thing that I've made it quite clear it is just um, regarding housing you know we don't want one big developer coming in and um, you know completely 
changing the whole thing and just building boxes. I think, you know, it needs to be uniformly um, done so different developers get the chance. But it's been nice. I've had a tour of the site and seen the beautiful deer that they've got on here as well. Um, but to be honest with you, it kind of looked like, to me, like... Um, like Chernobyl really, walking around Chernobyl it's slightly overgrown in places etc but just this kind of walking dead kind of feel about the place which is amazing I've seen the railway and everything but you know speaking to these guys from Harworth you know I think they're kind of um, really confident that they they want the right scheme for here as well um, which I've, I've, you know, I do believe that they do. They are as passionate um, about delivering the right scheme, and that's why you have public consultations like this. So, let's see what happens. Um, a lot of people are here. It's very busy. They're doing tours, so um, you know, at least they're opening the site up for you to have a look. I've been inside the turbine hall, but you know, what is one fact is these beauties here. They will be coming down, and. Uh... tourists in I think to have it stay the power station it's got to come down and we need houses so I'll build some houses for people uh, but let's have the tourists in and let's have some leisure facilities for the locals to help raise awareness for Telford Steam Railway to get a uh, steam loco back into Ironbridge basically and to see the nature and not have it as all houses basically <laughs> have some mixed use industrial uh, nature reserve, railway, good community links for people in Telford, especially where I live because we don't have community links, so the railway would be useful for us. Housing. But one thing I would like to see in another, if I could come back in 100 years' time, maybe some private housing or something like that. Uh, I would like a station pump house to be made a restaurant come leisure centre. Three buildings will remain on the site two large switchgear buildings and the original Power Station A pump house which is perched on the edge of the River Severn. Once the Power Station site is finally demolished and cleared, parts of the site are going to go under another five year plan to mine two million tonnes of sand and gravel on the adjacent land. Most of this sand and gravel will be dispatched via rail.
15 Morris dancers on the march. In the background, four famous cooling towers, which are about to disappear forever, 50 years after this photographer first encountered them. I was sent by the Shropshire Star to photograph the uh, last tower being topped out, as they called it. Um, so I went up in a lift, which was terrifying, and I knew some of the men that worked on top of the tower. There was no such thing as health and safety. One had a handkerchief on his head, they were wearing plimsolls. And at the time, I think I was earning about £12 a week, and I was told they were earning about £100 a week. When I got to the top of the tower, I knew exactly why they earned that sort of money. My uh, bedroom window uh, has got a perfect view of the towers. In fact, some of the pictures were taken from my bedroom window, the ones of the sunset and that. So I wake up every morning and see the cooling towers, and to me, they're iconic. The towers also helped Dave create one of his favourite news images. A front page photo to sum up nationwide power cuts in 1972. I realise that they can't be preserved, the, you know, the cost would just be outrageous to maintain them when they're not being used, but uh, really sad to see them go. I suddenly thought about six months ago that if I don't do something now, it's going to be too late. So I started off uh, with a few ideas, one of some kids playing football on this field in front of the towers. And then I had this idea that I wanted some horses going in front of the towers. So I, I organised that and I was really pleased with both results. So um, I sort of drawing up a list. Next in focus, the Morris dancers. Fortunately, the person I called had seen some of the pictures I'd done, so he was quite receptive to it.
One of the most anticipated events of 2019 was the demolition of the Ironbridge Cooling Towers. Shropshire gathered on the surrounding hillsides waiting to see the demolition of these four large cooling towers. The radio, the newspapers, the council, everybody was there to see the final moments. Then at 11 o'clock a.m. bang on schedule the towers collapsed in a plume of pink dust. <laughs> 